Well, let me just begin by saying, wow. Like last night and this morning, we have heard from the Lord through two brothers. Amen? Uh, good night. Uh, James, you didn't have to like get in my business that much. Uh, wow. What are two powerful words from the Lord that we've heard just in the last few hours? And I would just encourage you, like I did yesterday, don't, don't let the enemy steal those moments away. Like, meditate on that. Let God do the work that he wants to do. Uh, even in that last session, I, I, I got a feeling there's some of you that were on the brink of letting it go, but you just didn't yet. Don't, don't let today go by and not let that go. Don't, the Holy Spirit of God is not a water faucet. You don't turn him on and off when you're ready to deal with things. When the Holy Spirit of God begins to convict, that is the moment to respond. <laughs> Delayed obedience is not obedience. Some of you in that last session, the Spirit was convicting you deeply. He did me. I'm telling you. He said Bob, but I heard some other names in my head. And... Don't let that get away. What a word. What a word. Um, I'm excited about this session because of the topic that we're going to be talking about for a few moments. Um, and what you're going to hear me share in these next few minutes is something that as long as I'm a part of Sin Network and have any responsibilities in leadership, you're going to hear me say some of the things I'm about to say over and over and over and over and over again. Um, Rick Warren told me one time, he said, Vance, your people have not heard something until you're sick of saying it. So just say it over and over and over again. So I'm going to say some of this stuff over and over and over again, but it's because I'm so passionate about it. A lot of you know my story. I'm sorry for how many times some of you had to hear my story in an assessment video uh, because those of you that lead assessments are sick to death of it. But God changed my family's life in September of 1999. I was senior associate pastor of a church in Memphis, Tennessee, great relationship with a senior pastor. He was my dad, known him my whole life. Everybody assumed I'd follow him, be the next pastor. One morning, we're reading in the gospel of Luke and just looking for some stuff in Jesus that's not in me and come across verse chapter 4, verse 43. He says, I must preach the kingdom to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. When I heard that, when got my wife, Christy, who's sitting over here, we knelt down our living room. Lord, yes, we don't know where, we don't know when. But God ultimately filled in the blank with Vegas in the last 22 years of our lives as Southern transplants. We've lived in Las Vegas, Nevada, joining the activity of God and birthing a church. I've always told our church that I'm more missionary than pastor. I've always apologized to them. Look, you've got a missionary as your pastor, which means I'm not the best pastor. It also means I'm trying to work myself out of a job because the missionary's task is not to build the ministry on him or herself. The missionary task is to ultimately exit and pass the baton to indigenous leadership who can carry the ministry on for generations to come. The scripture says, the psalmist said, the plans of the Lord are from generation to generation, which means if what you and I are a part of is bigger than our lifetime, we've got to lead in such a way that we're preparing it for generations to come, which is a very Christ-like thing to do. Jesus focused more on succession than he did success. Unfortunately, today, we focus exclusively on success and don't even give an afterthought to succession. But because of that, I got the joy three weeks ago of preaching a sermon at the church that I planted 22 years ago and installing the new senior pastor who has been a part of our team for 15 years, have with a couple other guys poured into him, raised him up, and he's from Vegas uh, home, native there, and we're able to pass the baton to somebody from there to lead into the future. So 22 years of our life to plant a church through those 22 years there in Vegas, we've had the privilege of hosting an M3 conference out there. Uh, a lot of church planters have been there. We've had over 800 planters that have come to that three-day intensive where we roll out everything we understand about planting. And out of those 800, we've cherry-picked some of the best of the best, brought them into a year-long residency or cohort. And now we've been a part of planting 80 churches in the Western United States in the last 22 years. Had about 400 people that we've sent out of our fellowship because the end game is to send out. Amen? That wasn't hardy, but I'll take it. 
Now I've accepted this job of being president of Sin Network, largest church planning network in North America. Now I'm not telling you any of that story so that you hear my pedigree. I'm telling you that story so that you know I'm somebody who's passionate about church planting. I'd never heard of church planting in 1999 when the Lord spoke to my heart out of Luke chapter 4. I didn't even know what it was. I'd never been a, a part of a church that had ever planted a church. I'd never planted a church. I didn't know what the concept was all about. But for the last 22 years of my life, it's been the dominant theme of my life to involve myself, my family, the church that I'm a part of, in the multiplication of the church, churches being planted. So I want you to hear me say, I believe in church planting. But I want you to hear this next statement loud and clear. The church plant is not the goal. The local church that you are giving your life to plant right now is not the goal. Let me tell you why. Because it's going to die. Let me give you a word of discouragement. <laughs> All churches have a life cycle. They're born, they live, they die. Any of you ever heard the name A.B. Simpson? A.B. Simpson was the founder of what's called the Christian Missionary Alliance Network of Churches. A.B. Simpson's teachings and writings are a large part of what discipled and raised up someone we all read by the name of A.W. Tozier. A.B. Simpson founded a church here in New York City that touched the nations for the glory and honor of God. It was one of the largest mission-sending churches in its day and time. It was located over in Manhattan. It was called the Gospel Tabernacle. In its day, sat about 15, 1,700 people, packed out every weekend, sending people out, touching the nations. You know what it is today? John's Pizzeria. I ate there last week. I sat near where the altar was, where I'm sure people surrendered their lives to gospel work and ate pizza and garlic knots. Every church Paul planted in the New Testament, every church that got a book deal in the New Testament <laughs> is dead and gone. I've stood personally in the remains of the church at Ephesus and the church at Corinth. They are both piles of rocks. Once the epicenter of gospel activity in the first century, now churches that are dead and gone. If you think for one second Your church that you've given your life to plant. I, I, I've, I called my wife sitting at John's Pizzeria, and I said, Babe, I just realized one day they're going to serve pizza at Hope Church in Las Vegas. <laughs> You're talking about a deflating moment, 22 years of my life, and somebody's going to be kneading dough in the background. The church that's keeping you up at night, the church that's caused you pain the last two to three years is one day going to die. But hear me. The kingdom of God is alive and well. You see, what we've done is we've allowed the enemy to subtly change the goal. We've made the goal the church. The reason some of us are discouraged and depressed is because we're only looking at it through the lens of the success or failure of the local New Testament church. Like the church is the goal. The church is not the goal. The church, get this, don't miss this, the church, and don't write me off theologically, all right? The church is the temporary tool established by Jesus for the expansion of the kingdom in cities and nations all over the world. 
Now, the big C church is synonymous with the kingdom. I'm not talking about the big C bride of Christ. I'm talking about the local New Testament church. The local church is a temporary tool established by Jesus for the expansion of the kingdom in cities and nations all over the world. And hear me, the church you're pastoring is going to die, but the kingdom is eternal. The kingdom is alive and well. Let let me prove it to you. Look, I want to show you a verse out of Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. If you've ever been to a missions conference in a Baptist church, you've heard this verse. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain by your blood. You ransomed people for God from every, said out loud, tribe and people, language and people and what? Nation. The problem with verse 9 is we never read verse 10. You know what verse 10 says? You have made them a what? Say it out loud. You know what this whole thing called Christianity is moving towards? A glorious day when King Jesus steps off the throne, returns and establishes his kingdom for eternity on a new heaven and a new earth, and the kingdom of God from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation rules and reigns with him for all eternity. What's happening right now in the world is God is on a mission building that kingdom. He's using the tool of his local church for the expansion of that kingdom to every tribe, tongue, people, and nation on planet earth. The church is not the goal. The kingdom is the goal. And listen, the kingdom of God is alive and well. We're living in the greatest days in the history of Christianity to be alive. Did you know that there are more people coming to faith today in Jesus on a daily basis than at any other single time in human history? You didn't hear what I said or you'd have said something. So I'm going to give you another shot at it. We are living in the greatest days in the history of Christianity to be alive. There are more people coming to faith today in Jesus on a daily basis around the world than at any other single time in human history. Now, now get this. God birthed your church for such a time as this. Not so you could sit and have a great worship service on the weekend. God birthed your church to join in what he's doing locally and globally for the expansion of his kingdom. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. Now, here's why church multiplication matters. One church cannot accomplish the mission by itself. Get this. We want to be biblical missiologists. Amen? No church in the New Testament planted a church alone. That's why half the letters is Paul writing one church to raise money for another church is doing work in another place. There was always kingdom collaboration. The church has to be multiplied for the mission to be accomplished. One church can't reach a city by itself, much less finish the mission of the nations by itself. So church multiplication is the strategy that Jesus entrusted to us for the expansion of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. Now, some of you look like me. You're not not real sure you're, you're buying into this, so let me prove it to you. If you'd ask me for most of my pastoral Christian ministry. What's the book of Acts about? I'd have said the book of Acts is about the local New Testament church. It's the birth of the church, the growth of the church, the multiplication of the church. Did you know that's not what the book of Acts is about? Let me prove it to you. Acts chapter 1 verse 3. Look at this on the screen. Acts 1 3. Listen what it says. He, Jesus, presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days. Now, you know what this is talking about. The 40 days between the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. For 40 days, Jesus appeared to his disciples. For 40 days, look what it says. He only preached one sermon. For 40 days, he only talked about one subject. What does it say he talked about? What? The what? It's almost as if Jesus said, if you forget everything else I've taught you in three and a half years of public ministry, do not forget this. It's all about the kingdom of God. And yet the average church today, we don't even talk about the kingdom, much less know what it is. Go to the end of the book of Acts. Last two verses of the book of Acts. Acts 28, verses 30 and 31. It says, he, now we're talking about Paul, not not Jesus. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the what? Here's Paul for two years under house arrest in Rome, facing what he believes to be his imminent execution in Rome. Anybody that gets near him, Paul says, I want to talk to you about something. Let me talk to you about this. What does he talk about? Kingdom of God. 
The book of Acts opens with Jesus using his last words on earth to talk about the kingdom for 40 days. The book of Acts closes with Paul believing his life is over, spending his, what he thinks is his last two years talking about nothing but the kingdom of God. In the middle of those bookends, you have the birth, growth, and expansion of the local New Testament church. Here's what that means. The end game is the kingdom, but the local church exists to introduce people to the king, disciple them in kingdom living, and then send them out for the expansion of the kingdom to cities and nations all over the world. That's where church planning fits into this. And with the few minutes that I have left, I want to give you an illustration of what I mean when I say church planning. And to do it, I need three volunteers, and I need them quick because we don't have much time. So let me just, Aaron, you and Noah right here, you come. I need one. Y'all got to speak so you don't have to do it. I need one more. Brother, you come help me right here. That'll be my three. Come on. All right, y'all come stand right here. All right? When we talk about church planning, unfortunately, we talk about it in the wrong way. Most of the time, what I'm going to do, I'm going to tap you on the shoulder. When I, tell me your name. Ed. Ed, when I tap you on the shoulder, I want you to say loud enough for everybody in this room to hear, plant a church. All right? When I tap you on the shoulder, don't get ahead of me. <laughs> He's ready. I've tapped you on the shoulder. <laughs> plant a church. There we go. What most of us think about church planting was you go into a city, you send out a mailer, you tell them how your church is going to be cooler than any of their church has ever seen. We rent that sleek pulpit that's made out of metal. We find us a storefront, we find us a, a movie theater, and we plant a church. Then, what I want you to do is say, make disciples when I touch you. So we get into the city and we plant a church so that we can make disciples out of the people who are now coming to that church. We try to disciple them and pour into them so that we can, what I want you to say is engage the city with the gospel, all right? So we move into town, we send out a mailer, we plant a church. Then we try to begin to out of the people who are coming so that we can establish ministries to engage the city with the gospel. 99% of church planning is taught just like this. You go into a town, you find you a place, you get you a storefront, you, you send out your mailer, you tell them why your church is great. Here's the problem with this. This only works where people are looking to go to church. Yep. This is not planting churches. This is starting church services. That's a very different thing. This is not a biblical missiology. Listen, the Bible was not written for North America. The Bible was written for the peoples of the earth. Try this strategy in Afghanistan and see how it works for you. Go rent your storefront, send out your mailer, and see how that turns out. We'll watch you on the news, right? On your knees with some dude with a sword standing behind you. It's not going to turn out well. My premise is if it won't work everywhere, why are we using it anywhere as a missiology? Because missiology should be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. God gave us a manual for how to do this. It's called the Scriptures. You know the problem with this? It's upside down. Paul didn't go in and start a church. And here's another point about this, and I'm hurrying. Here's another point. The reason most churches in America are homogenous is because we start church services. And when you start a church service, you start with a culture that looks like, feels like, walks like, talks like the same, and it attracts people who are looking for something just like that. When you, do, when you start opposite, this is the way Paul started. We engage the city with the gospel. We start with the gospel. We don't think like pastors of churches. We think like missionaries in cities, engaging cities with the gospel. And when you do that, you engage cities with the gospel, then you make disciples. Here's what I find interesting. Jesus never said, go plant a church. He said, go into the cities and engage the city with the gospel and make disciples. And Jesus said, I'll build my church. You see what we've done? We've assumed that to ourselves, which belongs to him alone. Because we think the success is about the church when it's about the kingdom. So biblical missiology, Paul in Philippi, Paul in, in, in different places in the New Testament, starts by engage the city with the God. So that then make disciples. And then Jesus long a church. <laughs> then, then. You send out of that church back into new parts of the city or other cities, right? 
and you start all over again. And then you send out of that church and you start all over again. Thank these guys for helping us. All right, thank you. Now, that is what a biblical missiology for church planting looks like. And we have to get back to understanding what kingdom expansion looks like through the multiplication of the church. When we started our church in Las Vegas. We were three white dudes from Alabama and Tennessee. Not places known for our racial progress. I pastored a church in Las Vegas for 22 years. My last Sunday, we had 4,000 people with 54 languages represented in that fellowship. How does that happen? Listen, I didn't know anything about multicultural church. I'd never even heard of that. How does that happen? When you start with a city, guess what? The gospel's no respecter of persons. The gospel doesn't skip one culture. Here's, what, here's my premise. If your church doesn't look like it's community, there's a missiological problem with how you're engaging your community with the gospel. Not every church is going to have 54 languages in it, but every church should be as diverse as its community because the gospel doesn't skip over people. The end game is not churches being planted. The end game is the kingdom being expanded in tribes, tongues, peoples, and nations all over the world. And the only tool Jesus gave us is the multiplication of the church. It's not a tool, it's the tool. And that happens when we engage cities with the gospel, make disciples, and let the Lord birth churches that become sending centers to reproduce that over and over and over again. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you take these truths Burn them deep in our heart and soul. God, would you raise up a generation of planters and pastors who think like missionaries to penetrate the lostness of our cities and nations. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Love you. Amen. Well, let me say good morning to you and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Pastor John Wellborn from Staten Island, and uh, I don't know what I ever did uh, to Noah to make me have to follow the president, <laughs> but I'm really sorry, and I'll send you a gift basket as an apology if you never make me do this again. <laughs> what a word from our brother and our president, Vance Pittman. Uh, his passion is contagious, and I know I speak for this entire room when I say we are excited about where you are leading us in the days ahead. Amen? Amen. What an incredible couple of days we've been able to enjoy together. Uh, Pastor Crawford's message last night was, uh, was life-changing. I sat into an incredible um, breakout session with uh, Pastor Clay Smith just dropping gold on preaching and preparation. And then my friend and uh, co-laborer in the gospel, Pastor James over there, just messing all of us up in a very good way this morning as, it ta as we were dealing with, uh, with our marriages and families in the ministry. What an incredible time we've had together. Uh, I am from, uh, from the deep south, but seven years ago, the Lord called my family to relocate to the metro area and called us specifically to Staten Island. Staten Island gets a bad rap. I don't know if you've uh, heard the way that uh, the city in general refers to Staten Island. Uh, it's not very edifying, uh, quite frankly. And, uh, and I thought about this. Why is that? And I really think I've come to the conclusion that the reason Staten Island gets a bad rap is because everybody else is jealous. <laughs> they're jealous. And let me tell you what they're jealous of. I have a parking space 10 feet from my front door. Praise Jesus for Staten Island to be a part of the five boroughs and have that. In the few minutes I have with you today, I want to try to offer you a good word. The proverb says that anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word, a good word makes him glad. And the word I want to give to you today is the word resiliency. Resiliency. We're talking about kingdom multiplication, and I want to talk to you about what it means to be resilient in the mission. It's been the case in my life, as it has been, I would imagine, for every single one of you. These last few years have been terribly, terribly difficult. That word resilient, when speaking of an object, talks about its ability to bounce back into form after it's been, it's been affected. You think about a spring. You compress it. If it's a resilient metal and a resilient spring, it will spring back into its form. Uh, Stretch Armstrong is the famous resilient toy that we all enjoyed growing up as well. No matter what you do to it, it snaps back into its original form. As it relates to people, the concept of resiliency is able to withstand or recover quickly from difficult circumstances. Up until these last few years, I considered myself a resilient person. 
But it wasn't long ago that I had one of my dear friends and an elder of our church attempt to lead us away from the vision and mission we'd embraced together and try to remove me as the pastor of that church. It wasn't long after that uh, where a group started a new church and began actively recruiting as much as they could on the conviction that John doesn't preach the gospel anymore. These are people we'd vacationed with. These are people that we'd had dinner with, people that we had been very close to over the course of our few years in New York. And then, of course, we all watched as COVID hit and affected our city. We were the, M- the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States. And as we were watching over 800 people a day die in our hospitals, while we, for the most part, were locked in our homes and able to do very little about it, it kicked off what the media is calling the COVID exodus from New York City, which is no media concocted myth. At Salem Church, between the difficulties and challenges pre-COVID as well as what's happened the last two years, roughly half of our ministry database is no longer in New York City or connected to our church family. We've been cut in half. In the context of that, we've sat with dozens and dozens and dozens of friends and ministry partners, elders, staff, pastors, ministry leaders, as they said, Pastor, can you imagine how much house we can get for the money when we move to Dallas, Texas? Like, can you imagine how much cheaper it is, how much better the schools are, how much better our life will be, and now I can work remotely, Pastor. Aren't you excited of how God has opened this door? <laughs> Wasn't long into that season where my, my father, my mentor, my hero played racquetball in the morning and by that night had coded on a table and was been on life support. Two weeks later, he passed away. My best friend and my cheerleader no longer in my life. And it wasn't long after that, my second father and my mentor and my pastor had to resign his position in disgrace because of a a sexual scandal. All I can say is that I've never been so discouraged. I've never been so disheartened. I've never been so disillusioned. And it seems like in moments like that is when the devil really gets you to a place where you begin to question what the Lord told you previously. Am I really called to this? Do I really have what it takes to sustain in a place like this? Maybe it's just not for me. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. This season of difficulty made it even more difficult to believe that the vision that God had given me when I came here was ever going to come to fruition. It seemed farther away and more impossible than ever. And taking off really became a viable option. And it's amazing how the devil seems to know that. And it's amazing that's when the phone calls come from pastors and search committees and churches and places like, well, I won't say other places where you have two parking spaces within 10 feet of your front door. How is the vision of making disciples and multiplying churches ever going to come to fruition as we are declining and as we are doing more with less than we've ever done before? But I got to be honest with you, before I jump into the text in 2 Corinthians 4, I want to show to you, God gave me two amazing graces in this moment. And one was the fact that one of my dear friends that I'd known for many years became a brother. And by that, I'm referring to to my friend Vance. I've known him for 10 years. We connected hearts about, well, actually about 12 years ago. And we'd always been friends and we'd always had the Braves in common, but we we, we fight about college football. Um, But otherwise, in that season, he became a brother walking alongside that difficult, me in that difficult season. And so when he stands before us and makes the statement, you are not alone. He's not just saying it, he's living it and proving it with his time and with his focus and with his investment. Another grace that God gave us is he reminded me in that season, he reminded me in that season that this is his mission field, not mine. This is his kingdom, it is not mine. During the time where we had to take reservations for people to come to church, y'all remember that? Wasn't that fun? (laughs) There was a young woman that made a reservation to come to our church. Her name was Cammie, and she showed up. She'd never been to a Christian service before. She was from Pakistan. She was a seventh-generation Muslim. She could track her family back. She ended up at one of our services, and as she was there at one of our services, she was telling everybody that came up to her to greet her, I'm not a Christian, because she was afraid they were going to find out and throw her out because she was never been a part of a service like that. Over the course of the conversation, she and I had a chance to, to meet before the service, and she was telling me, I don't know why, but I just know I'm supposed to be here. And then she looked at me and said, do you know why I'm supposed to be here? Like I was the holy man that had conspired with God against her, and he and I knew why she was here. 
And I said, I believe the Lord spoke to you, and I believe you're here, and I'm grateful that you obeyed his voice. I said, enjoy the worship gathering. Please stick around afterwards and give me the chance to speak with you. And so we went through our worship services. After the service, she hung around, and, and as she was listening to the preaching, she said, now, you, you believe Jesus to be God, and we Muslims believe Jesus is a prophet. Uh, what, how, do, how does that bear itself out? So I'm settling in to what I expect to be a nine- to 12-month conversation with a new friend about extricating Jesus from her Muslim tradition and beginning to preach to her and share with her the gospel of Jesus Christ. What I thought would be a nine-month conversation, less than nine minutes later, she says, okay, how do I do it? (laughs) And I said, how do you do what? I am stunned. I don't know what she's asking. (laughs) She's had, how do I convert? How do I believe? How do I join? How do I come? She has one question, though. If I do this, my family can never know about it. Can I follow Jesus without them knowing? And I said, well, we'll discuss that and punt on that question. But for now, let me, let me encourage you in this belief. And so right there in the parking lot of our church family, she gave her heart and life to Jesus Christ and became a follower and a disciple and a sister in the Lord. Fast forward a few months. This past uh, month, we did a For the City gathering where we went out in the, in the community just sharing the gospel in creative ways. And she went to the boardwalk with a mission team that, or a mission group that had, a, that had a sign that says, how can we pray for you? And there on the boardwalk, this young lady that only a few months prior was Muslim, now she's a follower of Jesus and she's on the boardwalk preaching the gospel of grace of Jesus Christ to people as they come by and prayed with people as they were coming by and shared the gospel, then came back to our worship service and stand up in a testimony time and she preached, yes, Baptist, she preached in the context of our worship gathering about the impact God had on her. Here's what blesses me about Cammie's story. It is not a single, there was not one aspect of our normal processes that worked to bring her to the gospel. It was the power of God, the spirit of God drawing her to himself, and we were just ready to answer the question when it came up. What was amazing is that during the season of darkness, there was a man who was a lifelong member of the Sikh faith. Same story. Could not have talked him out of getting saved if I had tried to. Another man who was a vowed atheist reached out to me, said, we've got to talk. And he came to faith in Jesus Christ. It continued to remind me of his power and work. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. And of course, that jars of clay is an emblem of frailty. And why do we have it in jars of clay? It it is to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Dear friends, we are that jar of clay. We are fragile and frail. We have cracks and bruises and bumps. We have even holes and difficulties. But never forget that when a jar is cracked, that's what when something is inside, it can come outside. What we have that is powerful is not our our vessel. We have the treasure on the inside. And so what is going to make a difference in these moments of difficulty is not our intellect or our passion or even our resiliency. Inside the jar of clay is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the only power of God into salvation for those who believe. And so we can endure hardship like a good soldier of Jesus Christ because it's him that will accomplish his work through us as we surrender ourselves to him. That's what we believe and what we embrace. It's not my church. It's not my ministry. It's not my city. It's not my kingdom. It all belongs to him. So I should not, cannot, and will not quit. So if you're in a season like mine, if you've been through a season like mine, I suspect that's the case all across this room, and you're struggling to maintain your resiliency, I encourage you to ask God to help you and to see those ways where he is at work. It could be through a friend or a brother who's snuggled up next to you for just a time like this. Or it could be in ways that God shows you he's at work, in ways that you could not have possibly planned, and he continues to use you to advance his kingdom and to make disciples around you. Let me pray for us. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you'd help us with this idea of resiliency. And Lord, as my brother James preached earlier this morning, I pray God that this time of resiliency would not just be to be restored to what we were before, but we would be refined to the point that we are even more resilient and more surrendered and and more effective in your hands than we were before. Lord, we pray that you would help us 
for all of the camis and others around the city that are searching for you, that we would be ready to, re- to respond to this moment in need in a way that glorifies you, edifies the churches we serve, and advances your kingdom all around us. It's a privilege to be on the team and partnered with this incredible gathering. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 There's a question the uh, Apostle Paul asked in 1 Thessalonians 2.19. And can I ask you the question that he asked? He says this. What is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? What is it? That's our hope, our joy, and our crown. I really want you to think about that for just a second. Like you could stand before Jesus at any moment. It could happen today. And obviously we're made righteous by his work, not our own. We're good, right? But we're called stewards as pastors and leaders in the church. And we're the manager. He comes to us and asks, what'd you do with your life? What'd you do with my people? When you think back to all the years of ministry, all the meetings, all the planning, all the sermons, what would you say you would present to him as a trophy of all the work you've done? I, I mean, I imagine if, if, if I'm Paul, I'm standing before the Lord Jesus, I'm in heaven, he, Jesus looking at all my ministry, I'd be like, I'm pretty proud, my joy, my crown, book of Romans, man, it's pretty good. Check out chapter nine. It really messed with some people, man. I'd be like, did you hear my sermon on Mars Hill? I contextualized the culture. It was engaging. People believed. I survived a snake bite for you. And to be honest, so often when I think of that moment before Jesus, when I just present him all my years of pastoral ministry, the things I would be tempted to say, here's my trophy for you, Jesus. I'd say, check out this crowd of hundreds of people. I'd probably be like, have you seen our $2 million facility? It's got walls with garage doors that open up. It's kind of an open air concept in Baltimore. Pretty cool. Did you read my last Gospel Coalition article? Do you notice what Paul says his trophy is? The thing he's going to be boasting about, the thing that brings him the most joy before Jesus. He says, it's you. It's like actual human beings. It's the maturing disciples in Thessalonica. It's, man, I would imagine if you were to talk to Paul in heaven, the thing he's like so excited about, Timothy, Titus, Silas, Barnabas, Priscilla, Aquila. It's the people he multiplied Jesus into others into. I mean, think about the ministry strategy of Jesus. All right, Jesus, you got three years to change the world, to tell them the, the greatest news in the universe. How are you going to do it? You're going to run out the Roman Colosseum? Just gather a big crowd? Preach a, a fire sermon from heaven? Call in Phil Wickham? <laughs> Maybe give out iPads? Just get a bunch of people in a room. Nah, I think I'm going to have dinner with 12 guys for three years. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take Peter, James, and John on a hike up a mountain, and they're going to love the view at the top. I'm going to let them watch me as I minister to the leper. And then I'm going to send them out two by two to preach. And then they'll come back and we'll debrief. Jesus' primary ministry strategy was multiplication. And Paul, who was following the ministry of Jesus' primary ministry strategy, was multiplication, investing in other human beings. It's not just preaching sermons, it's spending time with other leaders. It's why Paul says in Ephesians 4, the job of the minister is not to do ministry, but it's to equip others to do ministry. It's why Paul says to Timothy, hey, I want you to focus on entrusting to other faithful men who will then entrust to other faithful men the greatest news in the universe. 
And what did Timothy do following Jesus, following Paul? He developed other leaders. And every generation thereafter has been following that pattern. And here we are with the baton. Revelation 7, 9 says that there will be a great multitude that no one can number from every tribe, from all uh, nations, all peoples and languages standing before the throne and the Lamb. There will be multitudes in heaven because the church did multiplication. And so you need to be multiplying or Jesus will find someone else to do it. And if I'm being like straight up honest with you, that isn't my natural strategy on my own. Small beginnings, a few people, a coffee meeting with a college student, a group of seven leaders in my living room. It doesn't really pop on Instagram, you know what I'm saying? And it's not what I naturally think about. When we started Redemption City Church, you know, the things I was constantly thinking about were my to-do list. Yo, how are we going to get some chairs? Chairs are $45 a pop? What the? F <laughs> and more importantly, who's going to pay for these? Vance, help me out, man. I'm thinking about my sermon this Sunday. I got to do this every week now? I'm thinking about finding a building. I'm thinking about greeting everyone that's coming through the door. I'm thinking about the, you know, there's poop, someone, a human being pooped in our alley, our church's alley. That literally happened. Uh, Pastor James, I'm going to be honest with you, that was not the fiery trial I was ready for. I was surprised when I found human feces on our building. These are real church planning problems. These are the things that I'm worried about. And if I'm not careful, like, I'm just constantly thinking about, like, let me just handle these tasks. Let me just... Focus on getting as many people in this room as possible. But I mean, I just look at Paul, I look at Jesus, I look at First Thessalonians, and I'm like, man, the things they were most focused on were human beings, a few at a time. When I was in high school, I played basketball. Uh, not, not high school, like basketball. I don't want to, it's not impressive. I played like in a church league basketball, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I was averaging like 20 points a game. It was great. <laughs> Not many Middle Eastern guys play basketball well, so average, average in 20 a game felt good. So, And, you know, our team our, was struggling on offense. We were settling for three-point shots, and we weren't scoring as much as we were able to as a team. And so our coach made us do this drill that I hated. He said, Every, we're, you guys are going to scrimmage as a team. Here's the rule, though. You can't shoot until you pass three times. I'm like, that is so lame. But every office of possession, we'd pass once, and someone would get the ball and be like, oh, I, I got a, kind of an open three, I want to shoot. But dang it, can't, coach won't let us. So we passed two more times. And you know what happened over time is we stopped settling for okay shots, and we started getting layups. When we focused on passing over shooting, we became a better offensive team. My question for you is, what if you did the church planning version of that drill? What if for every one time you do a ministry task, you equip three other times? You know what happens? The church scores more. But the problem is that you want to be Michael Jordan. And you're not. Let's be honest. At your best, you're John Stockton. You need, you need longer shorts. And you need to pass. Let Jesus be the Michael Jordan. And he is highlighted, he is glorified when other people are shining around you. Are you focused more on passing than shooting? Paul says that's your job. And the greatest church player in the universe, Jesus, that was what he did. Here's how our church did this. Year one, I intentionally set aside four hours a week to meet with about 10 leaders and we went through just some of the books that really impacted me as a, as a developing pastor and ministry leader. It's as simple as that. We took guys with potential and said, hey, I see pastoral ability in you. Would you be willing to do a pastoral assessment with me? And we just asked questions and then gave them a customized prep plan based on their growth areas and strength areas and said, do this. And if they did it, great, you're ready for the next step of the process. And I passed off ministry, whatever I can. John Maxwell says, if someone can do something at 80% as good as you, 
give it to them. Only do what only you can do. And what I've found is the real fun in ministry is not when I succeed, it's when I develop and equip others to succeed. You know, it's a lot more fun watching a guy I trained preach a better sermon than this one. Mike Crawford, the guy who preached last night, this guy has reached the pinnacle of evangelical church planning Christendom. He's preaching at stages like this. He's written a book. He almost beat me in golf one time. He's done a lot of really impressive things. <laughs> but something that Mike said that really struck me is he said the most fulfilling moment in his ministry, which probably is like 60 years. He's getting old. He's like the oldest guy in the, in the room. <laughs> the most fulfilling moment he ever had in ministry was at a Baptist convention in Maryland and Delaware event at a lunch break where he was walking to lunch and in front of him were three of the guys, three of the men that he had developed over the past 10 years. In front of him were Greg, Jay, and Jeremy, all pastoring and leading different churches that he sent out from Freedom Church. He said, I've never had a greater moment in my ministry than seeing the three of them walk in front of me to lunch. And I just want to encourage you from a guy who's done it, that that's the coolest moment you'll ever have. And so as we consider this, I want to ask you, does your calendar reflect the priorities of Jesus and Paul and Timothy and every generation thereafter in the church? Are you setting aside specific strategic time to develop leaders? Or are you just focused on the to-do list and the sermons and the task? And in, when you do preach to your people, are you challenging them to get off the game, off the bench and get in the game? Are you teaching and help, helping your people understand that they are not spiritual consumers, they are spiritual contributors to the kingdom of God? Are we asking questions like, not how many people are here, but what kind of people are here? What kind of people are we developing? Do we have systems and structures to develop people? Like, honestly, if, if a pagan Pete came to your church this Sunday... And he was like, all right, pastor, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll say yes to everything you ask me to do. Do you have a process to get him from pagan Pete to planner Pete? All right, go to, go to a gospel community, our small group. All right, you've done that? Now help lead it. All right, you've done that? Now I want you to go to this group leader training. All right, now you've done that? I want you to go to RCC Institute, which is our leadership development program. You've done that? All right, get an assessment. You've done that? Now finish your custom prep plan. You've done that? Now do a residency. You've done that? Now you get to be a church planner. Do you have a plan? Do your budgets of your church set aside money for the priorities of Jesus and Paul, kingdom multiplication? Do you set aside 5% of your budget towards church planning? Are you designating a percentage of your budget to give to the Send Network for greater kingdom work? I mean, we don't tell our people to wait until they have time to serve or wait until they have money to give. So why are you waiting until you have time and money to invest in leaders? And as we close on this, I, I just want to just be real with you. Everything in theory sounds great up here. But here's the truth. If you give your life to this, to multiplication, sometimes it'll, it'll suck. It's going to be hard. You won't get the credit that you think you deserve. And you'll lose some control over the church. But Craig Rochelle says that you have two choices. You can either choose control or growth. Pick which one you want. And if you do this, most importantly, like James said, people that you love and invest in will bail on you. For every child in the faith like Timothy, for Paul, there was an Alexander the coppersmith that did him great harm. For every Titus, there was a Demas that loved this present world. For every partnership with Silas, there was a breakup with Barnabas. For every Ephesian elder that you hugged and kissed goodbye with tears, there's a dude in the church in Corinth getting freaky with a stepmom. <laughs> Can I say that? I did. Oh, well. <laughs> it's in the Bible, man. Just read your Bible. My point is, it's going to hurt, and it can be tempting to, 
Stop pouring into people and just focus on your performance and your ministry because people are going to bail on you. They're going to disappoint you. And there are, I promise there will be Judases. If it was for the perfect Jesus, there will be for the imperfect you. But in your effort to miss out and avoid Judas the betrayer, don't miss out on John the Beloved. And if, if above all, you feel like I have no energy to give to this, I have, I have nothing in me to pour into another leader, just look at him hanging there for you. He went to that cross for a former Muslim kid like me. And in perhaps the greatest act of love ever, he stayed there. It wasn't the, the nails that kept him there. It was his love for me that kept him there. And he stayed there knowing I would look at his sacrifice and still abandon him at times. I would still walk away. I would still let him down. Why did he do that? Because he's that committed to my development. Be so filled with the love Jesus has given you that you can then go to your church and multiply it into others so that they can multiply it into others so that we can then be the multitudes in Revelation surrounding the throne. And let the disciples you develop be your joy, your hope, and your crown. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. <laughs> I was a huge work in progress, a mess, and yet you still went to the cross for me. And that even though I'd sinned, taking advantage of your grace, you stayed. Because out of your heart overflows love for me and for others here. And Lord, we, we pray that we would be filled with that same love, love for people who will let us down, and pour what you have given us into them. And that we would make the disciples we invest in our hope. The thing that we really believe will change the world. Our joy. The thing that brings us the most pleasure and happiness. And our crown. What we find the most confidence in. And may we be ready for the moment we stand before you and say, Hey, look at Molly. Look at Bob. Look at Tina. Look at David and Orlando and Tim. I poured into them because you poured into me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so, Mom, check, 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 Mike, you're on, check. Check, there we go. I was supposed to be done three minutes ago. And I refuse to get in front of hangry people. I don't know if you're going to put my slides up. Let's just lock in on this one verse. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. That's all. Forget the rest of my other slides. This is where we're going to hang. This is where we're going to close. Can we read this together? So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. We've just heard Vance give us the purpose. John give us a talk about perseverance. Adam remind us about people. And because... I've grown up Southern Baptist and I alliterate everything. <laughs> I mean, I've just written a sermon on what y'all just heard for an hour. This is the program. Fear the Lord plus comfort of the Holy Spirit is the sweet spot for multiplication. I was in North Carolina. I had to be preaching at like a church in Raleigh, North Carolina. And my, I called my dad. My dad's a pastor. He's 
my hero in life. And he's like, Rob, what you doing? He's from South Africa. I said, I'm preaching in Raleigh. He goes, I'm preaching in Raleigh. I said, well, when are you getting there? He's like, the day before, me and Vance, me and Vance were about to preach it to a bunch of men in North Carolina. I said, well, I'm changing my flight. I'm getting there. And I saw Vance stand up. And do you know that what he just preached to you, he preached at that men's conference, firing up one of our faithful Southern Baptist churches to be more about the kingdom. And over the last year, I've processed with my dad, um, as my dad has just made his announcement to his church that he has served so faithfully for 30 years, First Baptist Church of Spartanburg, South Carolina, that he's retiring. Now, he ain't gonna retire. My mom's already mad at what he's booked over the next year. <laughs> and she's like, you promised me more time with my grandkids. I'm in Pittsburgh, my brother's in New Orleans, my sister's in Zimbabwe. And so dad came up and, and I'm just thinking about his life, his legacy. And I've had the privilege recently of sitting under the feet of some legends of the faith. To me, none greater than my dad. And I invited my dad to come and pour into a group of pastors that I started meeting with over a year ago. I'm the only Baptist guy in the group and together we united together to ignite a movement in the city of Pittsburgh where I've served over the last four years to come together at Heinz Field. It's called some other name now. I don't know what it's called, but where the Steelers play. And we, we hosted an event. We kind of catalyzed an event called Pit Praise, Pittsburgh Praise. We had 15 to 20,000 people come out for this event, 200 plus churches. It was such a taste of heaven on earth in Pittsburgh. And I invited my dad to, to pour into these churches from these pastors from different denominations. And, and guys, no, I just can't get this image. My dad starts talking about his privilege of getting to sit under the feet of Dr. Billy Graham as he served as Dr. Billy Graham's pastor for his last 20 years on this earth. And he said as he started to hear from Dr. Graham and, and, and get to spend time with Dr. Graham. And then it became known that Dr. Graham was now going to join his church and he was gonna have the privilege. To be honest, he started to, to kind of well up with pride and, and started to think that he was something. And he said the Holy Spirit spoke to him one day as he sat watching Dr. Graham eat soup. And he had come alongside Dr. Graham for years and seen Dr. Graham host the leaders of the world in his home all the way through his last days and see him treat these ambassadors to the world in the same way that he would treat the individual who'd come and take the trash out in his house. And I wrote down what my dad said was, a word from the Holy Spirit to him. My dad said this to me and my fellow pastors in Pittsburgh. I was a nobody who thought that he was a somebody. And I was talking to a somebody who knew he was nobody. Fear of the Lord. Some of us are so full of us. You guys are strutting right now while you sit. <laughs> oh, may God humble this network. Oh, God, humble me. Make me aware of how great you are and how not so great I am. I need fear of the Lord. Saint, your church.
But oh God, thank you for your grace. Because my dad started to talk about how the Holy Spirit was laying the smack down on him. The Holy Spirit was also building him up. And we are all testifying here. These last few years have been hard. I served the Lord faithfully in New Orleans for 13 years. Those 13 years in the, the not so big easy ain't nothing on these four years I've just had in Pittsburgh. And I'm so thankful for the God of comfort. Because there's been so many moments where I'm ready to quit. And yet, the Lord is the lifter of my soul. And somewhere in the middle of fear of the Lord, comfort of the Holy Spirit, we will see, Send Network, kingdom multiplication. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I pray for my brother, sister in Christ right now that needs to be humbled. And I pray this with fear and trembling because Lord Jesus, I have really hated these moments in my life. But I'm thankful for them. And so Lord, unleash your holy fear into our lives because of how great you are. But Lord, I also pray for my brother and sister right now that's on the verge of quitting. God, may you remind them that you do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And God, may you be the great encourager. And God, as we enter into that sweet spot from Brooklyn, New York to wherever we go, May you multiply your kingdom for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.